at home who are listening in today. And because we're level two, we are still Zooming because we can't be in the chamber at this stage because of distancing rules, number of people and being in there without masks at this stage. So hopefully that'll change for two weeks time when we meet again, but at the moment we are um, on Zoom. So I'd like to call for apologies and I think we are all here. Yes, so there's no apologies, extraordinary business. And I believe there's one, Angus. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wish to raise an extraordinary business on property holdings policy for whenever in the meeting you wish, for wherever in the meeting agenda you wish to have it. And we can make that item number 10. And um, you're moving that? Yes. We have a seconder. Caroline. I'll put the motion, all in favour, so we take that extraordinary item of business, property holdings, raise your hand. Against, carried. Thank you, we'll call that item number 10 of business. Uh, declarations of interest. There is none. We'll move on to the confirmation of the minutes of the council meeting of the 1st of September 2021. Is there any alterations or additions to page three? Page four. Page five. <clears throat> Page six. Oh, Angus. Mute, unmute, Angus. All right. Um, in the Mayor's report, I definitely said, uh, Councillor Mackay recorded his vote against, question the ability of the project to restore. I definitely said water reliable water flows. I don't believe I said anything about ongoing risk to salt water breaching the banks. I think that was Councillor Lovett, to be honest. Okay. I, I never included anything about salt water. So the, the, the sentence banks. should the sentence should stop at the end of water flows. Thank stop you. And remove the other bit. Okay. Thank you. Page seven. <clears throat> Someone like to move that we receive these minutes as true and accurate with the um, one change. Stuart and Diane, all in favour, please say aye. Carried, thank you. Is there any matters arising that won't be covered in the agenda later on? No, we'll move on to item number five, which is the economic development Qu quarterly report. And Simon, we have you there. If you'd like to Definitely. speak to your report, please. I, I don't have anything to add, but happy to ask, answer any questions. Okay. Councillors, any questions of the report? <clears throat> Simon, I just do have one question. It's on page 10, down the bottom under the Pillar 4, Agriculture and Technology. Uh, talks about two pieces of work are underway to support a on-farm uptake of innovation and technology. What are those two pieces of work? Just so that, that's a project that Richard Fitzgerald's leading, and it's looking at the resilience of business, of farm businesses, and improving the resilience of farm businesses um, through um, looking at the farm systems and, and then looking at their adoption of technology and, and potentially uh, uptake of future future crops or, or, or future land use. So, um, so Richard's got that project um, scoped out and he's working with um, a, a, a governance group that's made up of local farmers, local um, farm, farm supply business owners to, to look at what the possibilities are and how, how farmers can make their, their businesses more resilient going forward. Have you got a timeline, Simon, of when you think you'll be bringing something to us for something yeah we, we can give you a, a an overview of the project at the next um next council meeting if you'd like okay sounds good Stuart question thanks Mr Mayor <clears throat> I see interesting piece in the paper we've signed an agreement with Christchurch New Zealand to deliver our district promotion former Mayor Gary Moore was chastising Christchurch City Council and said they're an absolute waste of money so it's obviously it's not universal, even local people in Christchurch think that they're doing a good job. Uh, 
I, I guess any organisation has its um, uh, detractors and it, its promoters. Um, and Gary, um, I've worked with for many years and uh, is, is not shy about uh, uh, about voicing his opinions. Um, we, we've put in place a number of KPIs, which I talked to you all about at the last meeting, um, and we'll be carefully monitoring those KPIs to make sure that, that Christchurch NZ deliver what we're paying them to deliver and we get really good value as a, as a district from that, that contract. Thank you. Angus, did you have a question? You're on mute. Yes, a couple, if I may. Um, if this council does pitch for an S F F F, what council resources, if any, will also be needed to go along that? Is question one. Okay. Um, so through the through the chair, um, uh, none none other than what we've already got um, got established under the economic development vote, Angus. So uh, just just essentially. The, our, our commitment is our current resource level, and the idea behind that fund is to leverage our existing commitment to get more um, more resources in play for our local community. Uh, the other one, Mr. Mayor, is um, particularly in Pillar Five. I'm very, very pleased to see, particularly recognising water as a crucial resource, um, and I totally agree with the writer. So, w will this council? Um, quickly start leading the way in efficient use of water, e.g. stock water, and when will this action start to, so we can lead the community by showing them how we can do efficient use of water? Um, so so stock water um, is, is, comes under uh, uh, Ian Soper, in sopers, and he'd be far better placed than me, Angus, to answer that question. One thing we are doing, Angus, so you'll notice, um, you'll recall that in the long term plan, we are putting water meters into the Methven Township to um, make better use, efficient use of the water there as a trial to see uh, if we can find leaks and, and save water. Angus, you have another question? Um, sorry, I'll re ask the question. Um, when will this council become a a leader in efficiency of water by showing what can be done with efficiency of its stock water system in the future. Um, it's, not, it's not an end sloper question, it's a council question. We've been waiting for endless reports on stock water, how to make it more efficient, like putting it in a pipe, getting other people to run it, it's dual systems and that sort of thing. And that's why I was so pleased to see this bit about water efficiency here in this report. I thought it was tremendous. So I'm asking the question, when are we actually going to start doing it ourselves to, to take a lead in e efficient use of water? Um, we'll go to the Chief Executive, Hamish. Um, the um, advisory group, the Water Network Advisory Group, chaired by um, Councillor Wilson, uh, is planning to meet, I think, within the next fortnight to review the trial with um, the Ashburton Lindhurst Irrigation Scheme. Uh, and once we have that review, uh, we'll know what further impacts there may be from that trial on the future management of the um, Stockwater Network. Supplementary, when will that come back to Council? Uh, it's, uh, the, the, next, the first available meeting following that meeting. Yeah. I think we're also going to do some work on the surface water strategy because we have um, targets we need to um, to meet in that. So that will be part of it, no doubt. Uh, Councillor McMillan. Thank you. Through the chair, um, has there been any consideration to um, joining up with the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs initiative? I know quite a few other councils um, are quite heavily involved. We're involved only through the TUIA program, I think, if that's correct, Neil. But um, it might be something to look at. I know you've got the My Next Move and we've had the driver licensing program, but the Mayor's Task Force for Job kind of um, would capture both of those. So just wondering if we, we could look at it into it. Simon? Uh, yeah, so definitely the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs is a fantastic initiative and, and they have a, a range of fantastic initiatives that underpin them. One of the bits of work that we're looking at at the moment is, is a review of, of the economic development strategy and just how that applies to 
the kinds of initiatives we need to, to, to bring in to the district for our young people. So um, Mayor's Task Force for Jobs will certainly be a key plank of, of what we do, I'm sure. They're, they're, they're a fantastic organisation. Uh, Councillor Cameron. Take the, take the mute off. I'll go to Councillor Wilson or Councillor Cameron sorts out a mute. Um, I, think, I think I'm sorted. All right. Are you talking to me or Stuart? Yes, Caroline. Simon, I know that you and I have had correspondence and that you acknowledge that the um, plan is silent on a CBD sort of strategy. And I'd like, I'm bringing it up so that it is recorded in the minutes that we'll be discussing it and, and developing um, some activities with regards to the CBD and, and small business in Ashburton. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, Caroline asked me the, the, um, the question this morning around where did the CBD feature in the reporting and, and the reporting is based around seven pillars, which um, this, the CBD isn't, isn't clearly a standout in any of those. And I think uh, clearly the uh, CBD is the heart of Ashburton. And in, in fact, the CBDs of, of Methven and Rakaia, et cetera, also need to be considered in that thinking. So um, as, as kind of the hearts of, of their communities. So yeah, definitely something we're considering. Councillor Wilson. You're still on mute, Stuart. Our stock order strategy meeting is arranged for the 1st of October. So the next council meeting would be either the 6th or the 20th. The 6th might be a bit quick just for the management to get the report fully out. But it's a report to uh, Councillor Mackay, it's in hand. Thank you, Stuart. And it will be uh, come to council in October, one of the meetings in October. So it'll be great. Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> uh, Simon, just a question on Pillar 7. There's some work being under, undertaken there on um, economic impact of the flood event um, and all around the flood event, really. Uh, when do you expect that work to come to Council? Um, I think we're probably about a month away from that being finished. So um, it's quite a large body of work that Professor Caroline Saunders has undertaken. Um, and um, um, so she's, she's looking at a variety of different... Uh, different outputs on that report. So uh, um, her team are, are currently interviewing businesses in Methven, I think, um, and, um, and and also trying to get information out of um, some of the government agencies in terms of how the, the data they captured around floods so that it can all be consolidated into her reporting. So I think about a month. Thanks, Simon. That's great. Uh, John. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Coming back to this work being done by Lincoln, who's actually paying for it? Um, the the council is. Thank you. If there's no further questions, can we have a recommend a mover and a seconder that the council receives the economic development quarterly update? Liz and Lynette. I'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All in favour, please say aye. Raise your hand. Thank you. Carried. <clears throat> Next item of business is item number six, the report on the Ashburton economy. And uh, Simon, in your hands again. Yes, yeah, so, so this report's based principally off the Infometrics <laughs> report that we, uh, the council, have subscribed to. Um, I've pulled out uh, the four kind of key takeouts from my perspective in terms of some of the, the big... Um, areas that are moving or, or changing um so that those being labor market consents um both residential and non-residential and commercial vehicle registrations which um have increased um a little as well so but happy to take any questions and uh, and provide any any sort of um broader perspective i guess on, on what's in the report it looks a good report and it's um certainly showing that the district is doing okay at the for their last um quarter which is which is good news they would be interested to see what the next quarter is because we'll have a, another lockdown of covid in there as well but interesting to see what that would be but this one's going okay councillor flynn 
certainly the timing of this report couldn't have been more perfect. But just looking at uh, labour market issues on page 15, I think paragraphs uh, four and five sum up the labour market issues very well, particularly as far as the local economy is concerned, where we've got job seekers, but for various reasons, they're not really prepared to get out and work. If I can, the, the thanks, John. It's a, it's a really good point. I, I've 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 had some further conversation with the Ministry of Social Development, and um, there there are a range of issues within that job seeker group, um, um, from um, you know some motivational issues to drug and alcohol issues through to some mental health issues that um, we need to think a little bit more broadly, I think, in, in our community's response to those so that those people can be well supported into employment. Um, and it, it may mean that we need to look at a range of initiatives to to, to promote that and speed up that process uh, rather than, 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 than just sort of um, leaving them in, in, in that, that sort of um, environment. And I know we have a range of excellent local community groups who do that. Um, MSD have a range of, of suppliers. So I think it's one of the things we need to do is take a closer look at that group and just um, make sure that what we've got is, is fit for purpose and see if there's anything else we can do that, that speeds up their, their re-engagement into the workforce. Yeah, that's important work. And I think, Simon, you've done the work on it or done the numbers and that 16 to 24 year age group, the unemployment rate amongst them, is it, is, is it 19% or something like that? I don't have that number to hand, sorry, Neil. But, um, but it yeah. might have been might have been a figure that I got elsewhere. But I think it's as, it's up near, um, it's under twenty, but it is quite high for that age group yeah. to be unemployed compared to our district average of um, three point something percent. So yeah. yeah, work needs to do on it. We need those people out working in our economy and uh, boosting it. So do, um, I think you're dead right focusing focusing on that area. That would be good. Uh, Councillor Lovett. Yeah, I was just going to comment on that as well. The kids um, today, you know, they're kind of like the entitled group, a lot of these young ones. And I think the schooling perhaps needs to bring in their system, uh, you know, talk about work ethics and what's expected because you only need to go out and talk to a lot of the farming community who's employing these young kids, you know, um, they get into get put into these jobs and they're only there for a week because they they go out boozing midweek and then they don't they late to work on the next day or they want a Friday or Saturday off and and they pack their bags and go. Life's too hard out working and I think it all goes back really to school years whether we can teach them some work ethics and you know right at an early age what's expected in the workforce. And, you know, you've got to work um, in, to get money. I think it sort of goes back to early teachings. Um, Sorry, can I just uh, add something to that as well? Um, we've, we've been working with a, um, the Ministry of Primary Industries and, and a group called SSEP, um, which is a, 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 a project that's been running up in the Waikato and MPI have, have funded its... Um, it's, 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 it's expansion through to Canterbury. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that, that that program will come to Ashburton. It's going to have a very agricultural focus, which suits our economy. Um, and and it, it, the whole notion of it is to support kids while they're at school to engage with businesses and, and industries to work out what they want to do, um, for businesses to engage with the schools and be more present in the schools and to provide pathways for young people to, um, to to exit out of school and into work. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep you updated with how we progress on that. Um, and potentially as early as the next meeting, we might have some development on that. Yeah, thanks, Simon. And you've already done some work on it. I think you might have been here when they had the expo with the two schools at the EA Network Centre where they come in and had that day, which was uh, one day or two, one day, whatever it was. Uh, was really, really good, well received. So you, you're working on it, you're highlighting it, um, which is good to see and we'll get there, I am sure. Angus. Um, Mr Mayor, the report, I believe, 
very, very good. I enjoyed the read. I thought it was right on the button. But just query um, on page 16, uh, item 12 under combined residential, EBOS is funded by brands. What does all that mean, please? Sorry, so e EBOS is a consultancy that looks at building supplies. Um, and does they it stand for something? Uh, I'm not sure, Angus. I can go and find out for you. Okay. Um, and uh, but brands are the um, the oversight for the building industry, um, and they they funded a report that 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 EBOS the consultancy did. So, but I can I can find out the details of. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Rawlinson. Thank you, and I too was concerned to read that we've got 1,100 young people in our district between 16 and 24 who are totally disengaged from employment, education and training. Um, and to me, that is a big concern. And I know a lot of work is done in their direction, but it just crossed my mind. And it's probably a question for Councillor McMillan through the Caring for Communities group. Um, is there any work being done there as well in that field? Can I answer that? Yeah, um, yeah. Not directly, but there's a lot of agencies, as Simon said, that are working so um, with youth. So um, Safe and Mid Canterbury have different courses like Cactus, etc. cetera. Um, YMCA do lots of courses um, with students who have left school but still um, need some tuition, et cetera. So there is lots going on, but... Back to what I sort of mentioned before about the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs, that would be kind of ideal in this space, um, I think, of, of getting those sorts of people, getting their confidence up and, and helping them into the workforce. And I know the schools do a lot of work as well. So it's there, it's just trying to... Just when I'm mute, just shot, you muted yourself, I think, Liz. Yeah, that's all I needed to say. Yeah, I think the old saying it takes a um, a village to raise a a, tr a child. So um, I think this is dead right in this instance. Can I just the... ask a supplementary there, um, Mr. Mayor, and probably for Simon, although he hasn't been here that long. But some of these programs we've had, and that expo that was at the EA Networks for all the school kids was great. But it would be really interesting to know of successes as well. And for the other work program that Bevan was running, I can't think what it's called, but it would be really interesting to know for the work that's gone in, just what rate of successes there have been in getting some of these kids engaged in work. Yeah, I can I can certainly um, look back and, uh, and draw some of the evaluations together and present that back. I think that's probably my next move. Yeah. It's still, still going. Uh, Councillor Letham. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Could I rather just add a note of caution here? I agree with what previous speakers have said, but this is a parenting and education problem. It's not a local government problem. We should do what we can to smooth the path for these young people, but let's not get too wrapped up in the social welfare side of things. Uh, Hamish? Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to um, the, uh, Councillor Rawlinson's question, one of the things that's always a little bit difficult is to draw a direct line between uh, a promotional type event or initiative and, and someone moving into either education, training or employment. Um, and often what we find is that the expos like we had uh, at the EA Network Centre uh, might light a fuse. It might... Um, provide a little spark that someone goes away and thinks about and nothing happens that afternoon that's directly attributable to that event. But somewhere down the track, a person is inspired to um, change something about their life such that it uh, has a positive impact on their education, training uh, or employment. And so sometimes those direct corollaries between an event and an outcome are um, a little hard to establish. What, what we tend to hope is that those events um, um, add to the story that might inspire someone to do something a little bit differently down the track. Um, just in response, I have a question, but in response to Roger's remark, we've also got to acknowledge that the Local Government Act suggests that we look after our four well-beings, of which is social and economic. 
which is obviously impacted by youth unemployment or disengagement from work. Um, the point I wanted to make was with regards to the traffic flow and getting back to our old chestnut, the bridge. I see that we're at um, our traffic flows up 10.6% versus 9.6, I think, for the rest of New Zealand going by that Infometrics report. And this is in, a, in, in the preamble or the, the discussion post that um, um, the numbers, it said that that's due to low tourism. You know, that's why the rest of New Zealand is low. Well, we've also had low tourism, presumably, heading south, and our numbers are up. So, Simon, are we, can we use that statistic anywhere or is that useful with regards to our, getting our second bridge and getting some funding for that or even, you know, filling our gap with the Waka Kotahi in the... Um, funding that we got, you know, that we requested that $5 million gap for our roads. Caroline, I might go to Hamish on that because I think he's going to let us know there's a, um, the second phase of the business case coming to us soon. All right, thank you. Yes, in terms of the um, uh, the business case that Stantec are preparing on the second urban bridge, that is um, nearing completion uh, and Council uh, will be considering that on the 6th of October. So you'll see how all those economic factors and the connectivity uh, between uh, our district and, in fact, the wider South Island uh, um, is impacted by, uh, by that bridge uh, working appropriately and, and the um, issues that uh, the congestion uh, faces. So I guess the economic story around, um, uh, around connectivity is very much a part of the business case, which Council will consider uh, very shortly. Simon, I just have one question on page three of the Intermetrics report, and it's around employment, and in brackets, got place of residence, and we're minus 0.7%. What does that actually mean? What's it referred to? Um, sorry, I'm You're good? We can yeah, hear you. No, I've got my um, I'm not sure. I, I need to come back to you on that. I, I, I pre I, I'll need to come back to you on that. I'm, I'm no, that's okay. I, I was wondering what it was too. So um, yeah. the research. Oh, Hamish might. Um, no, I think from the description, um, it appears to be a um, reduction in employment for those living in the Ashburton district. So that, that, would like, that would point be seven like that. 0.7 of a percent reduction in employment for those living here. I think that's what it's saying. So the unemployment would go up by 0.7%. Is that the other side of that? No, it might just mean that you've got people um, travelling in and out of the region. So people that live in Timaru or Selwyn or Christchurch travelling into the region as opposed to, uh, um, you know, living in the region. And okay. that, that might, that might, there might be... A, I need to look at that and come back to you with a bit more information, but that might also be down to the housing constraints that we're sort of facing as well. But, yeah. And, and three, Mr. Mayor, it's the reverse of that as well, I presume, is that um, people who live in the Ashburton district working outside the Ashburton district. Mm. Uh, so it's not to say it's directly related to the unemployment rates, just saying as a wee snapshot um, that there is a reduction of those that live here um, working. Yeah, yeah, we update on that would be great and see whether that trend is a good trend or a bad trend. I, yeah. I can't tell at this stage, but um, that'll be great if you could do that. Do, do, would you just like me to cover that off with a note to the elected members outside of there? I, I think so, that would be good. Yeah. Yep. yeah, just flick us an email what it is just to let us, let us know what it means. Uh, any further questions on the um, Ashburton Economy Infometrics report? If not, Liz, you want to move or question? Oops. I just have a, and this is probably a really, really dumb question, but um, I'll ask it anyway. So with the tourism expenditure, I see we've gone, we've increased by 2.2%, which is great. Um, does the spending up at Mount Hutt, because the parent company's in Queenstown, does it count for our district or does it count down in Queenstown? Um, does anyone know that or is that something that so 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 it 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 should be counted in our district and infometrics do smooth 
the data to ensure that GDP is captured at or spend is captured at the point of at the point of use. So, um, and and so because I had a conversation with them earlier on about the dairy payout and why that's disproportionate to GDP in the region, and the the answer is that because there's a whole range of costs that are incurred in in, in the dairy payout that might take place outside of the region it doesn't directly correlate with gdp and um, the same would be true of this i think that you know that where where the spending occurring uh, in the district it's captured within the district um but but obviously um new zealand ski are based in queenstown so their their figures will be lodged um you know, their corporate figures will be lodged but that shouldn't um that shouldn't interfere with with the way that expenditure in the district is recorded Thank you. Simon, we could just um, ask them a, to uh, uh, Infometrix that question that Liz has asked, whether yeah. it is recorded here or not. They'd be, just email it out again, that'd be fine. Hamish? Yeah, just, just reflecting on that question, I mean, that would be true of so many um, other businesses in the Ashburton district who might have ownership um, held elsewhere. So it would make, it would make a mockery of um, a district's GDP if it was counted where an absent owner happened to be based. So um, I'd be very confident that it's counted inside the Ashburton district. Yeah. Okay. Someone would like to move the recommendation that we receive the Ashburton econ Economy Report. Liz and yeah, uh, Caroline. I'll put the motion all in favour, please say aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Next item of business is CAT Community Grants, round two, item number seven. And we do have an extra paper there, and Claire is with us. Lovely background you've got there, Claire. And um, councillors, any questions? Or Claire, we have, uh, well, we met this morning to consider the the grants, we just have a question on the Upper Rangatata Gorge, and uh, you were finding some more information out about that. Perhaps you could, and email to councillors, perhaps you could just take us through that. Yes, so the information I found is there is 50,000 every year for the north side of the Upper Rangatata Gorge for um, weeds um, and weed eradication. The rest of the funding is for planting, fencing. Um, on, I'll just bring it up. Um, wetland restoration, pest trapping, propagation, and um, jobs created. So, and that's part of the um, Jobs for Nature grant from the government. Um, talking to the group, they are no longer receiving the Department of Conservation funding because of this funding, it is replacing what they're getting. Um, so this has bumped up what they're doing for weed control um, on both sides of the both sides of the river. Okay, Councillor Cameron, your question. Yes, thank you. So the fifteen million clear is that being spent on both sides of the river for weed control? Or the because you've articulated fifty thousand per year for four years, which is two hundred thousand. From my understanding, this is on the north side of the river, um, so they are using the full fifty thousand this year for the north side of the river. So I'd imagine that there'd be a fifty thousand for the south side of the river as well. Um, I didn't get asked that in the communication, um, and the rest of this. Um, so the total funding was seven point three thousand, uh, th seven point three million. Um, from this funding. Have you got your sides of the river right? Because we are the north side. Yes, uh, sorry. So the north side of the river is receiving 50,000 a year and I believe the south side would be receiving a similar amount. All oh, right. So that only comes to 400,000, doesn't it? For both of them, if they get 50,000 each. So what's the other 14 million being spent on or 14 and a half million? Uh, seven, 7 7.1 million. Would be oh, the rest of it. Because the other was for the yeah, biggie pardon. Yeah. Yep. And that would be for the wetland restoration, um, fencing support, pest trapping, propagation, plant and planting natives. And that's over four years as well, both sides of the river. Yes. 
Thanks, Glenn. So to move forward on this one, we need to make a decision on the upper ring of Tata because whatever we decide there will affect the um, other applications. So there's a request there for 5,300 for the upper ring of Tata Gorge. Does the councillors agree to grant that or not? Councillor Lovett. I don't believe we should give them the full amount. I think we need to bring it. I would like to see it come down to just to acknowledge them and bring it down to a thousand. Seeing they've got so much government funding and put and split the other, the other between the two um, bike parks. That, that's my opinion because um, it's more local and um, they're not receiving massive government funding. Yep, it's your suggestion is a thousand. Carolyn, you've got your hand up still. I've still got another question, Neil, but it's, a, my, it's not my turn, is it? Okay, we'll go for you now you're there. Now you're there. Okay. Um, Claire, further to that, they're no longer getting their DOC funding, though, are they? So this funding is not in addition to what was, it's instead of what was. Yes, it is. Yep. So is there a growth or an increase in that funding? What were they getting via DOC? Um, I didn't look into what they were getting by DOC, but I think it was not nearly as much as this fund for the next four years. And um, after talking to Ian Hyde too, he, he did um, allude to the fact that there is going to be a lot more money needed to be sent on this area in the years to come. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. I would be in favour of leaving it at 5,000. The volunteer group are doing a lot of work up there and it's what they are concentrating on is obviously a bit different to what um, the government of wetlands and fencing and stuff. So I'm in favour of leaving it at five and that will the flow on effect will mean that the other recipients will be much the same as we discussed this morning. It, it, to be to be precise, it's actually 5,300 is the recommendation. Well, 5,300 then. <laughs> okay, that's what you're preferring. Councillor Rawlinson. And I would support that because I see this as, as particularly for weed control. Councillor Cameron. Um, I was just going to, if that was a, um, do we move the motion on that? I was going to second that if that was a motion or do we not need to do that? Uh, we'll move the whole motion at once if we all agree that it's 5,300 as in the report, which will affect the um, mountain bike ash burton and bike methans. We'll go back to the original numbers that were in the report. So by doing that, you will uh, be changing those other numbers um, that were discussed in a workshop this morning. So if you'd like to move the recommendation that is there, that council allocates 26,142 in community grants and funding for the following categories. John, you moving? Question, moving. Second up. Caroline, second. Caroline. I'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All in favour, please say aye. Against. Carried. And clear, we've still got one other, um, it was a late application. Can you just talk us through that one? It's not in my papers. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe there are any other applications. What was the Rakai School? Uh, that, uh, that, so that was the event funding that was discussed this morning. So that's included in the recommendation. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, that's fine. It's in there. Yep. We've done them all. Thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you, councillors. Uh, moved and seconded and um, passed. So we will move over to item number eight, which is the elected members remuneration and allowances policy. And Rachel, Rachel, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this policy proposes two changes. Um, the first being a change to the communications allowance. So there's small increases proposed for um, councillors, the Methvin Community Board Chair and members. And the second is just an administrative update um, to allow for the clean car discount, which may be applied should the mayor choose to have a mayoral vehicle. Happy to take questions. Questions, councillors? 
No. Would someone like to move the recommendation? Councillor Lover. Councillor Falloon. Open for debate. Being no debate, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against. Carried. Thank you, Rachel. Short and sweet. Uh, item number nine, Mayor's report. Any questions on the Mayor's report? You will note the um, the RDR AGM is coming up on the 5th of October. Uh, we'll just have to see what um, requirements are for distancing and spacing for under level two, but that will be going ahead. Um, we have a recommendation there that council appoints the Deputy Mayor's proxy to vote on council's behalf at the RDR Management Limited AGM on the 5th of October with the Chief Executive as the alternative representative. Angus moved. Yep. And Diane Rawlinson second. I'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Gary. Presuming there was no discussion on it. Angus, there was no discussion, was there? No. Right. Thank you. Um, community Honours Awards, 9.3. And um, these annual awards have been given out. And we've got two recipients this year of the Mayor's Award for Public Service, Trevor Crory and Patricia McLaren. And um, the Ashburton Medal was given to the Mid Canterbury Rural, Rural Woman New Zealand Provincial. And there was civic award given to three people, nearly cross, James, also known as Jim Henderson, and Kids Meffin for their skate park. There will be a um, community announcement, uh, presentation of that at a time to come soon, as soon as we've moved probably out of le level two to level one, so we can do it appropriately, and we'll organise that when we get there. Um, any questions for the Mayor's report? If not, uh, I'll move, if a seconder, that we receive the report. Liz? All, I'll put the motion, if there's no debate. All those in favour, please say aye. Carried, thank you. Item number 10, which is the late um, extraordinary business. Angus, thank you. Um, Mr Mayor, in July, the 28th of July council meeting, we moved that um, we hold off on any further uh, looking at selling property uh, that under the, um, oh, I've forgotten the word, <laughs> Um, under our holdings, property holdings, holdings policy. we've had a, we've had a workshop, and we've decided that it, well, we've decided to put some motions forward today that look at holding the um, holding off until I think it's March or April next year to revise the policy, which is its normal calendar um, review. So for this to facilitate, I move that Council revokes its decision of the 28th of July 2021 not to accept any further applications to freehold Glasgow lease until the review of the property holdings policy has been undertaken. I so move. Yeah, yeah I'm just looking. There's three recommendations in there. I might just be going to Philippa here. Philippa, is the first recommendation, do we need to do that one first, which is above that one in our papers. Yes, that's correct. So you need to revoke the July resolution and that's dealt with and then you move on to the next recommendations. So that first recommendation is that pursuant to section 46A item 7 of the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act 1987, the following item be introduced um, as extraordinary business. No. So you've dealt with that at the start of the meeting. You now have the item placed as item 10. And, yep. your first, and your recommendation that you're dealing with at the moment is simply the one to revoke the July decision. When I read out. When I read out. Yeah, exactly right. Have a seconder for that, Councillor Rawlinson. Yes, I'm happy to second it because I support that idea. 
Yeah, open for debate. Councillor Wilson. Yes, I'm against the motion. I'm against the motion. I think we should maintain what we're doing at the moment. Um, we can. We've got some more in the pipeline at the moment, obviously coming through, so we can deal with them in the usual um, manner. And by March, we we'll, should have a free hand to decide then exactly what we do. Councillor McCoy, I didn't give you the option to speak to the motion, if you could do that now, if you wish. Uh, maybe in the light of what Councillor Wilson has said, may I read the motion again, Mr Mayor, please? Can do. Um, that Council revokes its decision of the 28th of July 2021 not to accept. So we're revoking not to accept any further applications to freehold Glasgow leases until a review of the property holdings policy has been undertaken. If Council um, approves this um, revoking, I will then seek leave of you to, to um, uh, move the next recommendation that Council undertakes a review of property holdings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Councillor Cameron. I want to see a review of the whole asset divestment and what we're going to do with that in parallel to this motion, if, if indeed this motion passes. I, um, I sort of support Stuart's position with regards to divesting of property without um, having a strategy in place with what to do with the the proceeds of that, and I'd like to see something done in parallel with that. I'm just not sure of all these double negatives, Angus. I'm just not sure what we, what we. Are you going back to status quo? Is that your motion? Yes. Yeah, I can't hear him, but yeah, okay, thank you. Councillor Flo. Yeah, just speaking um, with what uh, Councillor Wilson said before, that he thinks the status quo should remain. To me, that is being unfair on those leasees at the moment who would like to carry on and go ahead and make application to the council to freehold their leases. So to me, the time to do it will be when we look at the review in March next year, because from my point of view, I think the policy we have at the moment is a very good policy and that gives us the flexibility and we can look at a number of issues which we need to look at when we're looking at the sale of land. Councillor Latham. Yeah, th thank you, Mr Mayor. I just want to be doubly clear here. I think I've got it right. What this motion is um, saying is that we're going back to our current policy and revoking the, the hesitation we had in the, in the selling of Glasgow leases. <clears throat> That's my understanding. I'm with Councillor Falloon. I think the current policy we have uh, is a good one. And it would be unfair on those tenants who uh, would normally have the opportunity to freehold um, if we put a hold on it until we review it. So I just wanted to be doubly clear that this motion, if it is passed, we revert to our, our um, plan, our policy, prior to the 28th of July 2021. Yep. Hamish? Uh, yes, just to confirm, <clears throat> uh, pardon me, just to confirm, Councillor Latham, that that is the effect of passing the motion before you now. Thank you. Councillor Mackay, you need to write a reply. Um, I, thought I, I thought I did until the Chief Executive spoke. We have to revoke the, the July motion before we can do anything else, and that's what this does. Correct. I'm going to put the motion, but there are no more speakers. I'm in favour. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Against. Two. Recorded. Okay. Passed. The next um, motion, which I think... Angus. Angus. Mr Mayor, if I may, um, I move that Council undertakes a review. Can people hear me? Yes. The Council undertakes a review of the property holdings policy in the first quarter of 2022 
number two of the recommendation that council requests officers to bring forward advice on reinvestment of the proceeds of property sales to maintain a diversified investment portfolio. Councillors, oh, I've got a seconder. I've got a second to Councillor Latham, seconding. I'm seconding. Yes. Um, there has been much discussion, Mr Mayor, as I, as I have heard around the council table about councillors wanting to review holdings policy, but when it comes to the crunch, it seems that they want to make sure that the money is reinvested in a way that the proceeds can be used for the good of the people they work for. That's the constituents of the Ashburton district. Some feel that maybe we're not diversified enough in our investment portfolio and they would want staff to bring back some advice on that. I urge you to vote for the motion. Councillor Latham. Uh, thank you, Dad, seconding the motion. Uh, Mr Mayor, I just agree with Councillor Mackay. I think it's the right thing to do at this point in time and it will be enable us to focus in the next uh, six months on, on making sure we get our policy correct for the future. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Will our management be telling people that want to make an application before um, the date that we review it that they would be in danger of not actually succeeding? If we change the policy, will that be changed full stop? Or are we going to have a big, long overhang of people that are going to race in and apply for to freehold their property knowing that there's a possible change in policy? I think if we change the policy, the policy will be changed. And people need to know that if they put an application in, if they get it done before then, if they don't, they'll have to go on the new policy. Correct. Hamish? Uh, well, yes, that's exactly what will happen. We will, if this is, well, it has been passed, uh, what, we're now going to deal with property sales as per the policy. And then this is calling for further review of both that policy uh, and implications of a different uh, reinvestment um, strategy. So we will just continue now to deal with requests for freeholding as we ordinarily would until the policy might change. And then we have a, a call to make around those that might have expressed a view and in train and how we, you know, we grandfather uh, um, conversations that are already underway or whatever. Um, but that was exactly the same thing we did when council uh, put in place the temporary revocation in July. We, we handled that in, in, in the same way. Any speakers for or against the motion? Councillor Lovett. I totally support it because I would hate to see progress stifled. You know, there's a lot of uh, buildings in this town on Glasgow leases and to update them, they need to have ownership of them. And and I think if if we go back again and stifle it, there'll be no progress, no updates. I fully support what we're doing. Any further speakers or for or against the motion? Write a reply, Angus, not required. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your right hand. Against? Passed. Uh, Lane was it an against? Was it no? No, it wasn't. No. Well, good. Passed. Thank you. That takes us to the end of um, the open part of the meeting. But we do have the Office of the Auditor General presentation at two thirty. So we may um, adjourn the meeting until two thirty, unless we can get them on earlier. Um, yeah, there's no point in doing the in committee now, I don't think. It'd be better to wait until the Office of the Auditor General presentation has happened. So, um, adjourn the meeting until 2.30. Sorry, um, through you, Mr Mayor, okay. could I just advise while staff are present that some staff may have joined with the expectation that there will be a session of in committee briefly before 2.30, but that's entirely your call. Okay, shall we... Um, Go, move, we'll move into committee and then come out of the committee once we go back, to, once the Auditor General comes on line. 
Um, Stuart moved, Roger second. All those in favour, please say aye. Yes. Carried. Thank you. Uh, Ruben, if you give me the okay when you've...
I don't see Ruben online, so we'll just chase that, please, uh, for a minute, Mr. Mayor. Shall we hold until they come back online? Oh, no, streaming's there. Yep, yep. Sorry, right. I said. Yep. Yep. Welcome back and um, re adjourn the meeting. Um, Councillor Wilson moved in. Councillor, someone else seconded. Di Rawlinson seconded. Uh, welcome, Derek. Yeah, who else have we got there? I can barely see from the audit office. Uh, well, you've got the Auditor General. My name's John Ryan, and we've met oh, before. Yeah, hi. And uh, with me, Hugh Jory, who's our sector manager for local government in your area. So, hello. Yeah. Thanks, thanks you. Uh, yeah, and uh, John, uh, you do remember meeting you in Blenheim. I had a good chat there. That was great. So, um, yeah, we'd welcome, welcome you to attend one of our meetings. We thought it might have been in person, but Zoom's better than nothing. So, um, you've got a wee presentation for us, if you could. Uh, well, um, firstly, thank you for asking me. I um, did appreciate that. And um, I, too, am a bit upset that I can't be there in person. I don't know if you like me. I, as soon as I get on a plane, I feel slightly guilty for many reasons, you know, COVID, carbon footprint, um, you know. I'm racked with guilt by the time I get off it, so it's nice to do a Zoom meeting, but I would very much appreciate a chance to meet you all in person as well, so thank you for the invitation and uh, acknowledge that. Great. Um, well, Derek's here as well. I'd just, um, yeah, Derek's here. Uh, Derek. yeah, so I'm not sure to what, it's, what would be most useful. Now, I can talk a little bit about the office and what we're interested in and our role, but um, I'd also be really interested in hearing from you and the council around sort of well, firstly, the floods, clearly, but other things that are on your mind down there, Three Waters, um, local government reform, RMA, you've got a bit coming at you, um, and just what your thinking is around some of those things. So I'm in your hands a little bit. I can I can talk a little bit about what I'm interested in, what the role's up to at the moment. But um, Okay, if you give a wee over, overview of um, the Auditor General role, and then we can come and tell you what's keeping us awake at night. Okay, well... Um, it's always good to confess to the Auditor General, so thanks thanks for the offer, you know, it's a problem shared. Uh, so look, I'm the Auditor General. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a role that reports to Parliament, so I don't have a minister. Um, I don't report to the government. My role is direct to Parliament, and it's one of the few roles that, that spans local government and central government. So under, if you like, under my uh, area, I've got three and a half thousand public organisations uh, and we do sort of three things uh, with those. We, we audit them, clearly. Um, and about half uh, by value are done by Audit New Zealand and about half by private sector auditors. Um, of the 3,500, uh, it sounds more than it is in some ways because 2,500 are schools. So they are a different kind of uh, scale to most of the rest of the public sector, obviously. Um, uh, I also do inquiries where I've got some concerns about the use of public resources. So that's um, recently uh, some of the more high profile ones you might have seen. Uh, we looked at the purchase of a house for the Vice Chancellor of Auckland University. Um, we looked at the Auckland Light Rail procurement process. Um, uh, we looked at Westland's building on a stock bank a few months uh, when I first arrived, which is quite a big task. Um, so we do inquiries, which tend to be high profile and a bit at the meaty end of, of the Auditor General's role. Uh, and we also do performance audits, which is about effectiveness and efficiency um, of the public sector, which is, which is again outside the financial audit you'd be familiar with and which Derek uh, does on your behalf. My main role is, I think, to be uh, improving the trust people have in government in New Zealand, local government and central government, and to try and also improve the value of those services to the people uh, who benefit from them. Uh, on the trust side, uh, there's three things that drive trust. The first is uh, public entities doing what they say they should do. So are you delivering the services for your community that you should be? Are you reliably delivering those services? Uh, and are you doing those um, uh, with a degree of integrity and honesty? And I, I guess that's, if you look at all the surveys, um, about 60 or 70% of the trust the public has in the public service is driven by, or public sector is driven by uh, whether they think you're honest and, and working in an honest fashion. So I, I've got interests across all those, those um, areas. Obviously the financial audit looks at 
looks at the systems and processes around an organization and how it operates, uh, its service performance. Um, but in terms of my, and I have to do that work, but then I have an opportunity to have a discretionary work program. Um, and each year I consult with Parliament on that, but it is my choice as to what I look at and, and where I go. Big areas of interest for me at the moment, um, well, obviously COVID. Uh, we did some work on the uh, PPE, uh, you know, the face masks at the very early stages of lockdown last year. We've looked at the vaccine rollout, and I'd be interested in your perceptions and uh, of that in, in your area, your district. Um, wages subsidy, we did quite a lot of work on that and uh, wrote a report about high trust policies that uh, and, and the need to verify afterwards in those areas. Uh, but outside of that, we've also done work on uh, recently on conflicts of interest, particularly in local government, uh, around the integrity questions and, uh, and how organisations are managing that. Uh, and we've shared that widely within local government. I'm also uh, quite interested in infrastructure spend at the moment. So we are looking at uh, the Shovel Ready projects and the New Zealand Upgrade projects, which came out uh, over last year, but a lot of money is still to be spent, and the Provincial Growth Fund and how that was reshaped as well. Uh, and then more in the social sector this year, I've got, um, I'm looking again at family violence and sexual violence, which is a big issue across New Zealand uh, and the government's looking to respond to that in a different way. Uh, and I'm also looking at education. Uh, so areas where people uh, might be, where, where education is using data to work out those that might be disconnecting from education and uh, how they're responding to that. Uh, and quite a large uh, piece of uh, set of projects in Māori accountability. I'm looking again at how Fano Ora has been going and also money that has been allocated to Māori initiatives, just what's been achieved uh, with that. Um, what else is on my mind at the moment is an acute auditor shortage across the country. When I say that, uh, often people smile slightly because of all the shortages, um, probably auditor shortages is the one that least worries people, but actually from my point of view, it is quite a worry. <laughs> um, you know, I, I am statutorily required to audit all those public organisations uh, and with the borders closed, uh, it has been quite a challenge for us to audit and I, I'm not, um, you know, I, I know that we went to Parliament and asked to move deadlines for a couple of months uh, this year, which they've agreed to, and next year to allow us to do those audits over a slower time frame than normal. My general line on that is that I, I don't want to move deadlines, but if I have a choice between a poor quality audit or a slightly longer audit, I'll always go with a slightly longer uh, audit. So that's sort of my role. I'm independent. Um, really, other than passing legislation in Parliament or a minister or a council can't, can't tell me what to do. I'm completely independent. And that's the strength of the role, so that when I speak or I give... Um, uh, table reports in Parliament or write letters, then I am not biased in any um, political fashion so that I can speak, uh, if you like, truth to power without some sense of political bias. Uh, and my role is quite carefully protected around that independence. Uh, so that's that's me. Um, Thanks, John. It's a, it sounds like an exciting role you have. And um, yeah, the, the shortage of uh, staff, you're obviously seeing it, and I know we discussed that, but we met in Britain. Yeah. Um, and we yeah. also at Ashburton have uh, shortages of labour in all sectors. So uh, it does, it's obviously affecting your, your business as well, which is, it's good in a way, but not good in a way, because at least it's sending the government the message that it's 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 everywhere, labour shortage, and something needs to be done about it. So I've got a few hands up for questions. Three Waters is on our mind and at the moment. Uh, we're in the eight-week period. We've put a document yeah. out for, to the public for some feedback and we'll uh, look at that feedback. I think the 22nd of September, that shuts off. We'll analyse that, discuss it as council. We've gone through all the numbers. We've got questions that'll all be heading up to the DIA by September 30th for, um, as, as requested from them. Uh, we haven't made a decision whether we opt in or opt out. We're still in the information gathering, which is, um, I believe is, is good. We want to be fully informed when we do make the decision later in December. Uh, LG reforms, we're working on them. Um, the first report comes out in November, I think, from... Um, uh, Maybe a bit sooner, even. Uh, was it the future, future, future of order. order. Yeah, sorry, sorry, future of... Uh, yeah. Future local government. government. Um, 
six one X CEO Wymaker. What's his name? Hamish is um. Uh, Jim, 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 uh, Jim, Jim has Palmer, actual okay. reports due out um, before the end of September. Oh, okay. yeah. oh, oh. very, very shortly then. And yeah. the RMA, it's just building momentum on that. Uh, vaccine rollout, um, we're one of the lowest in Canterbury for vaccine um, numbers of people being vaccinated. We're working on that with DHB. Um, the booking what do you system, put that down to, Neil? Sorry, what do you put that down to? I think it's the booking one of the things we think is the booking system okay it's, yeah it's clumsy it's not easy to work um it's sending people out of the district to have their vaccinations if you ring on the 0800 number it sends ashburton people to geraldine because there's bookings there and there's none here it's it's not good and it doesn't seem to be improving we've got the target of getting whatever well we don't know what the target is um it hasn't been stated but um uh, getting people vaccinated. Um, we want to be vaccinated, but it's proving hard to be vaccinated. So we're working on that. Hopefully we can make some movement there. So, but the council's got some arms up. So we'll go to Stuart first. Unmute Stuart. You're welcome to Ashburton. I know your title can be intimidating, but having met you, you're a very approachable person. My question is, um, Shovel-ready projects, as is well on the way, there's a lot that weren't and even yet are not on the way. Is there any prospect of some of that money being recalled and reallocated to ones that have actually got projects that are started or ready to actually start? Uh, thanks for the question, Sarah, and thanks for the comment. I, uh, my title actually puts people off incredibly quickly, so um, it's very nice that you saw through that. Um, so we're looking at that, uh, the process around the decision making to initially allocate the money. Uh, and uh, as you know, while my role has a lot of powers, one of the things it doesn't have is to comment on policy. So the policy just to have a shovel ready project, we can't comment on or what they might do with the money that might be uh, underspent or, or not spent according to schedule. We are interested in how uh, the government went about making the decision to invest in the real, in those sets of projects, whether those processes were fair and transparent. And so that's where our report will head. Um, I, I, I don't think we'll comment on unspent money and what we should do with it because that would be drifting into policy, but we're interested in how the initial decisions were made. And from memory, I think they were meant to be able to be delivered or at least commenced within a 12-month period. I think that was one of the criteria, wasn't it? So, yeah, I think we will certainly um, reveal that kind of information in our report, but we won't be talking about what might be recycled. I know that you've got a bridge down there that you've been looking for some money for, for example. Um, yeah. Any assistance there would help? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, it does seem uh, that you've had a few, uh, the flood certainly shown how vulnerable it could be. Yeah. It is. We're working on that as well. John. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation, which answered a lot of questions be, uh, before I even had to start asking. But traditionally, the role of the OAG has been to check the figures in everybody's financial accounts and make sure they comply with the relevant standards, be they international or local type of thing. So yeah. you've got a set standard to compare things to and whether we make the grade as far as our financial presentation and contents are concerned. You stated in your presentation, you're now getting into more, I call more social um, audit issues. So what are the standards that you're actually basing those against? Mm. Uh, that's the, uh, look, ex that's an excellent uh, question because, um, uh, you know, when we look at an area, we try and find out what good practice would be. And one of the things that I've been concerned about is that um, we often write reports that tell someone they haven't done something well or whatever, uh, but we, we don't have enough effort on helping people get it right to begin with. Most public sector agencies actually want to get it right and giving them guidance to do that is really helpful. So in part, to answer your question, we've, we ourselves have started to issue some good practice guidance uh, and to refresh guidance we had already in place. So things like cost recovery, uh, sensitive expenditure, um, 
trying to remember, conflicts of interest management, LAMIA. We've put guidance out on a lot of that material. So we do have standards that we've, if you like, developed and set. Uh, in other areas, we often uh, seek out best practices. So we would do, at the start of a performance audit, um, uh, we would look at if it was procurement, uh, the government procurement rules, and make sure that they compared our work compared to those rules. If it's about a joint venture, for example, on family violence, we'd look at what a design of a good joint venture would be, and we'd look for those characteristics uh, when we went about uh, our performance audit. So. Uh, I think it's a really important point you make that we need to not make up the rules. We need to make sure we understand what good practice is before we go and look and compare. And as you get into those softer areas, as you might describe in the social areas, that, that can be quite challenging for us. Yeah. One of the, one of the big projects we've commenced this year, for example, is um, we're looking at uh, uh, Operation Respect within the military, which is their... Um, their work to address uh, um, inappropriate behaviour within the military. And so getting the standards right in that will be very important for us. So it's a real challenge for us as we move away from, as you say, uh, generally accepted accounting practice. But there are most areas that you can find good practices or standards to base it on. Uh, Hamish, C. Hamish. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nair. Um, good afternoon, uh, John. I, uh, one of the issues that um, is concerning um, me and a number of my chief executive colleagues in the sector is the cumulative effect of uh, reform proposals. So without um, expressing a view on the merits of any individual piece of reform um, to, to your point around policy, do you have any concerns or views or planned work on what um, the, the wide range of reforms might mean for uh, the viability of some units of local government. Uh, if you <laughs> take out three waters and you minimise our planning function and we wait to see how um, Jim Palmer's, in, in my view, is another funding review, really, um, we wait to see where that lands. Uh, but do you have any kind of medium-term concern that these reforms will have a a domino effect on the viability of some units of local government? Um, a carefully worded question, uh, Hamish, to try and draw me into some political uh, uh, matters, um, but well done, uh, good, good attempt. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the future of local government, Three Waters, RMA, you know, probably in a perfect world, that wouldn't have been the sequence that you would do them in. Um, you might do them in a different sequence. Um, but these things have all got a long way to go. One of the things uh, that I'm uh, going to do in the office over the next uh, period of time is uh, I'm going to publish information on our website of the underlying performance on those sectors that are going through reform. So to take a sector that's not yours, um, the health sector is going through considerable reform over the next 12 months and obviously beyond that once um, once the new structures are in place. Um, and I uh, intend to publish on my uh, website current performance and then track performance through those uh, through those change processes. And I see that as a really important aspect of um, uh, making sure my role maintains its integrity, which is about the performance of the public sector, the decisions around the shape and, and um, policy decisions around structure are not really my place to go. But I do understand uh, the stresses that local government's under. And I think, Neil, you've already spoken to your concern about maintaining capacity and capability inside organisations that are, at, 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 given, given the other constraints we have in the economy, but also if someone thinks that the council's not going to be in the same shape or I don't have a career path in the council, will I be then looking to go somewhere else? And I think that will be a really significant challenge for the next two or three years in the sector, if not longer. If not longer. Just to, with uh, Mr. Me, with your discretion, just to leave you with the thought that an auditor often would have a view as to the viability of the organisation on an ongoing basis. So I wasn't trying to trap you into a comment on... <laughs> Um, no, I didn't. I was being, I was being policy. Helpful. It was a genuine. Um, it was a genuine question around: as the auditor of the sector, yep. would you 
are you thinking that it's a worthwhile piece of thinking to do around what some of these reforms might mean? So that was my only... I think when the, when the reforms take, take shape, that will be a question that we will have to look at in terms of every council. If, if your assets have gone, if there's different, a different shape to your business, then we would look at ongoing viability as, as part of our financial audit. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, my question is regarding NZTA Takawaha. Um, do you audit? I mean, Transmission Gully no north of Wellington looks like an absolute mess. And the way funds are allocated, do you ever look at that at all? Or is that all government policy or independent NZTA policy? Or how does that work? Uh, we we could look at that. That would be within scope to look at how that project was uh, decided on and and managed from the government point of view, from Waka Kotahi's point of view. I could look at that. Yes. Now, there has already been, as you may know, an inquiry by the Infrastructure Commission, I think, into into that project. So we don't tend to inquire where somebody else has already looked at it. An area of inquiry could be. The, um, the amount of money we get to maintain our local roads we know is not enough and the National Land Transport Plan don't give us enough and our roads are going backwards and there's not much we can do about it. Um, we have the transport companies here and the fuel taxes that leave the district which go to Wellington and get distributed and they keep further heading further up the track so we're told um, for what leaves here and what comes back here um, is a shortfall and our roads are deteriorating because of it. It's a, uh, I know it's a Canterbury issue because the mayors of Canterbury talk about it. So it may be something to assist us with at a higher level. We need more funding for roads, local roads. Yeah, yeah. There's the funding decisions there. Uh, the other thing we had looked at, and we do have a report on our website at the um, looking at these maintenance of state highways. So we looked at that last year, I think it was, and um, and uh, one of the things we saw in that was a, a change to the standards that the state highways were being maintained to. So it's not just local roading, it's also, uh, if there is an issue at local roading, there's also a change to the standard that the, um, the highways are being maintained to. And I think, you you know, we're all aware that the Land Transport Fund does have some funding challenges ahead. Mm -hmm. It does. And, and you're, you're not alone as well, Neil, you know that probably everyone, every council, Stuart, has had um, would probably have a similar story to say about uh, maintenance and uh, co-funding. Yeah, I know the Canterbury Merrill Forum talks about it and um, we just did our regional land transport plan, but um, we never got what we asked for. We got about 80% of what was asked for and we only asked for what we needed to maintain our network. And um, yeah, so it's an ongoing issue for us anyway, but um, grateful you acknowledge it. Uh, Councillors, any other questions? John or Hugh, and uh, Derek is there, our auditor is there as well, who actually does the audit. It uh, doesn't look like there's any more questions, so thanks very much for joining in. Great discussion. Um, yeah, and hopefully we can meet in person. Um, I'd like that very much. Yeah. No, thank you. Thanks for your time, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Neil. Cheers. Thanks, thanks Hugh. Bye. Thanks, Derek. Um, Council, we might um, now, we've now finished the open part of meeting, we might move into committee, then take an afternoon tea break. So I'll move, we move into committee, a seconder. Liz, all in favour, please say aye. Yes. Thank you very much. Why don't we take a, um, we've got someone coming in at